to be here. I'm really pleased to have heard David talk about how this event is going to be full of fun and charity. I was a missionary of tw charity for 20 years. We didn't have a lot of fun. <laughs> um, but I want to thank everyone for inviting me here, especially Pamela and David and the audiovisual guru Bruce and all of his friends for patiently helping me with the mechanics of this presentation. I'm going to talk a little quickly because I know you're all smart and can keep up and also because I think I'm starting my presentation a little late and don't want to throw everything off schedule. Um, so here we go. Follow along for the ride. Exploring new questions intrigues me and for this presentation I knew that I wanted to think about stories. Sometimes as I explore new questions, the words I send in response to the email you send saying, we need your title now, we're sending the program to press, don't quite fit when I actually get around to talking to you. <laughs> so this is the title about stories that you all have in your programs. But if I were asked for a title today, I think it would be this. As I pondered the question of stories, I was increasingly struck by the importance of what the fuck moments. <laughs> Not so much the what the fuck moments within the stories themselves, but the what the fuck reactions that happen inside each one of us. And the way those what the fuck moments relate to stories, whether those stories are real or true or not. Also, who doesn't like to hear an ex nun repeat what the fuck 77 times during her presentation? <laughs> stories are important. Our brains have designed themselves for stories. The brain's basal ganglia arranges events, thoughts, desires, memories, and so much more into narratives with beginnings, middles, and ends. Stories give us a way of organizing the world. They inspire us. Stories sometimes place us within a tradition and sometimes invite us to dream of worlds far, far away. Stories help us to imagine that our future can be different from our past. Stories help us to know who we are and who we can be and so much more. Stories convey values. A lack of stories can be dangerous. Let's give you a very personal example. My only brother Joe came to recognize that he felt no romantic feelings towards girls. He was drawn to other young men his age. He was a teenager in southeast Texas in the 1980s. The beloved son of a Catholic family where his parents obviously had plenty of sex, but never ever talked about sex. Joe knew of no one else who felt the way he did. He occasionally heard mention of fags and the local Christian radio and TV shows often ranted about homosexuals. But he couldn't understand how feeling the way he did made him an evil person. And he couldn't find anyone he felt safe talking to about this. The result? Extreme shame, confusion, and eventual suicide attempts accompanied by long-term hospitalizations on psychiatric wards during his high school years. How I wish Joe had been a teenager in the era of will and grace. How I wish he had been taught Oscar Wilde and James Baldwin and E.M. Forrester in his high school English classes. I even find myself wishing that my brother had been a teenager in the age of the internet. Joe didn't have a story that could help him make sense of his life. But just as a lack of stories can be dangerous, so can a multiplicity of stories, especially when we believe very firmly in those stories. Think what happens when stories of ongoing racial discrimination meet stories of white supremacy or when scientists explain how the actions of human beings are changing the climate, then they meet other people who claim climate change is God's way of hastening the end so that we may enter paradise more quickly. Stories are powerful. Stories portray, explore, and convey values. 
I originally hadn't planned to talk much about my personal story. I mean, I lived as a nun for 20 years, then I wrote about it for 10 years, and I sincerely hope I do not have to keep telling this story for the rest of my life. But karma is a bitch, and Pam told me, your story is unique, you have to tell it. Then when I asked her for a whiteboard for my simple presentation, she said, don't you want to share some of those great photos you have? We're going to spend what I hope will not seem to you like an inordinate amount of time telling my story. Then we'll talk a little bit about your stories, fictional stories, God stories, which are of course a subgenre of fiction. And then I want to spend some time talking about American stories, because I think that's especially important today. Before we move into any of these stories though, I want to return to the most important part of this presentation. Oops. We've all had what the fuck moments. Moments when you heard or experienced or saw something that caused such a visceral reaction of shock, disbelief, or consternation that you set aside all rules of public decency and said either aloud or to yourself or to the person next to you or to your television or phone screen, what the fuck? <laughs> right now, I want everyone to think about a recent or not so recent what the fuck moment in your own life. For some of us, those moments might have involved a family member, a church, a mosque, an election, something you read on the internet. <laughs> Something that you couldn't immediately make sense of. A moment when you felt something resembling an electric shock. Can everyone think of a moment like that? <laughs> now, I'd like to hear about those moments from all of you, but that's not possible today. So these are my requirements. I'll hear from four of you, but only with these conditions. If you can speak really loudly from where you are, and only if you can tell us about your what the fuck moment in three sentences or less. A beginning, a middle, and an end if required. Perhaps your WTF moment will not even require an entire sentence. If you are brave enough to tell us about your WTF moment, we will all appreciate it. But the one who tells it in the least amount of time is the one who will get a free copy of my book when I sign books at noon today. Brian is going to keep the stopwatch, and the lights are a little hard, but I'm going to try to see who are the first four people who raise your hands. One, two, three, four. I don't know if you were first, but you're the ones I saw first. Okay, so in that order, stand up. Number one, very loudly. Brian, you got your stopwatch going. Let's go. Number two. Number two. actually number two or three or something? Yeah. I think we're all going to agree on that one. So Brian, who was the one who said it shortest? Number three. Number three over here with Trump. Come see me afterwards. Yeah, we've all had those moments. We've all had those moments. And now I want something similar. I want some participation. What are the characteristics of those moments? What did they feel like to you? Whether it was Trump, whether it was, I am clearly labeled an atheist, yet still you don't believe me, or whatever it was in your life. For example, I will say that one of the characteristics is that this event is probably something that I was not consciously expecting. 
It was a surprise. Anybody else with a loud voice who can think of another element common to what the fuck moments? Yes? Yes, please, quickly. Okay. Um, what's common is that it challenges everything you thought you knew up to that point. It does. It challenges what you thought you knew. It challenges your story. Another characteristic? Disgust. Disgust. You're a certain amount of disgust. That doesn't accompany all what the fuck moments, but many of them are accompanied by disgust. An affront. It feels like an affront. Like it's, it's slapping you in the face. It's slapping you in your body. It's slapping you in your heart. It's slapping you where you never thought where anybody was going to slap them around. <laughs> Depression, it can lead to depression. It's like, ah, and what can I do about this situation? And all kinds of, one more. One more. The person who's speaking to you is not the person you thought they were. Oh yeah, isn't that scary? These fuck the fuck moments when, oh my God. Oh, yeah, okay. So. As we continue to think about stories and clashes between reality and stories, the story we had about the person we thought we knew, the story we had about the America we thought we knew, we're going to examine these what the fuck moments and going to look at those five different kinds of stories I promised you. And there's no way to say everything that could be said about these kind of stories. We'll touch on them briefly. And as I said, we're going to spend an inordinate time of on the story of Mary Johnson, but if you want more, you can always buy the book. <laughs> My story starts out innocently enough. One before that. I was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan in 1958. I don't know if the, something happened with the slides. This is actually the slide that comes next. Let's we'll try to sync them up. My story starts out innocently enough. I was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan in 1958, the firstborn of a good Catholic family, and like many good Catholic families at the time, as the firstborn girl, I was named Mary. Continuing the good Catholic tradition, Kathy came along pretty quickly. Then Cindy and Dorothy. Then Margaret. Then Joe and Heather. By the time Heather came and I was 12, my dad had changed jobs and the family, oh, I forgot, I'm the one with the clicker. It's my fault. <laughs> By the time Heather came and I was 12, <coughs> excuse me, my dad had changed jobs and the family had moved from Ann Arbor to Beaumont, Texas. The biggest culture shock of my life. Legitimately, my first major what the fuck moment even before I knew the word. We had moved from a liberal diverse university town hauling nine people hundreds of miles in a station wagon to arrive in the last school district in the country to desegregate, which would eventually happen in the 80s, long after I'd left home. When I attended my all-white public junior high, we did have half a dozen African-American students, but somehow the school was always referred to as all-white, I was shocked to discover a dress code that demanded dresses and nylon stockings for all girls beginning in the sixth grade. People in Beaumont were friendly, which was nice, even if they talked funny, but they were clicky in a way that it took a long time for me to begin to understand and there didn't seem to be much intellectual curiosity, which even as a child of 12 distressed me. One thing I admire about the American atheists is that they often hold their conventions in places where atheism isn't a widely respected part of the local culture. And then they do things like give the community 30,000 lunches, is that what he said? Yeah. Um, and having these conventions in places that aren't used to interacting with atheists can create many what the fuck moments, both for conference attendees and for the folks we meet in the hotel and around town. What the fuck moments can be very valuable. From a religious viewpoint, my family fit in Texas just fine. It would have been easier if we were Baptist, but Beaumont had a large Cajun influence, so Catholics were tolerated, mostly. 
When this photo was taken, I was in high school trying to decide what I should do with my life. I had options. I was a good student. I had edited the school newspaper. I was one of the stars of the debate team known for humiliating my opponents, and my classmates had voted me most likely to succeed. But one day, when I was in the library, I saw this cover peering out from the periodical section. Something about the nun's eyes drew me in. And I sat down in a corner of the library behind the reference section. I skipped French class to read the article. As I read about Mother Teresa and the way she and her sisters ministered to the poor, my future became clear to me. I was meant to follow this nun. Without a word to anyone, within a week, I sent off a letter to Mother Teresa, Missionaries of Charity, Calcutta, India, asking her to accept me as one of her sisters. Many letters and two semesters at the University of Texas later, I found myself in the South Bronx, where Mother Teresa pinned a crucifix to my dress and made me an aspirant on my way to becoming a full missionary of charity. Aspirancy was kind of like boot camp, total immersion, sink or swim. At the beginning of aspirancy, we were 12 young women seeking to become nuns. At the end, after six months, there were two of us left. Something, this is the sisters' refectory on a feast day. Because sisters from other houses were visiting, there wasn't enough room at table, so we sat on the floor. I'm the one playing the flute. Notice the calluses on my knees. This picture was actually taken the first month I was there, but the calluses were already developing. We did a lot of praying. After six months of aspirancy, the two of us who remained were sent to Rome for postulancy, where we joined six European postulants who had trained in London. After postulancy, Mother Teresa cut our hair, gave us habits and saris and new names. I became Sister Donata, which means freely given. Novitiate was two years of prayer and study preparing for vows. It was also a time in which we learned the virtues of corporal penance, wearing spiked chains around our waists and biceps and beating ourselves with ropes made of whip whips made of ropes. We begged our food from wholesale markets and local bakeries, lugging home plastic bags of rotting sardines on the public bus, eating soup made from chicken feet, which were not only boiled to make broth, but were also to be sucked for their nutritional value. Had my what the fuck moment arrived? <laughs> Unfortunately, no. Our reality, as bizarre as it was, matched the story. Jesus suffered for our sins, and we were to suffer for the sins of the world. Jesus became poor, and sharing the lot of the poor meant eating food other people didn't want. All these strange things were somehow virtuous. They fit the story. We were to live the life of Christ, who became poor, chaste, and obedient. When the day finally came to become brides of Christ, we professed our vows in church during mass with lots of people in attendance. Instead of a wedding ring, mother tucked a wooden crucifix under the cincture at my waist. Now, what was left was to live those vows. I'll give you just a few examples. Poverty. We had two sets of clothes, washing one set by hand while wearing the other. As we hung the clothes to dry, we often prayed that it wouldn't rain. Poverty also involved as much, doing as much of our own work as possible, whether painting or plumbing or even building our own shack to live in, as the first sisters who arrived in Rome did. Chastity. I like this photo of Mother, which I found on the web, because it shows something of Mother's attitude towards human touch. In this photo, I think she's saying, Hands off, please. I remember once mother had met individually with dozens of very affectionate Italians. When she finally entered the room where we were all eating dinner, she was wiping her face with the back of her hands, murmuring, kisses, kisses, kisses. She headed straight to the washroom. The primary obligation of chastity was to renounce marriage. But for Mother Teresa and her sisters, chastity went much further than that. Chastity required keeping our body and soul, all our affections, solely for God. If you've noticed the photos you've seen so far, 
none of the sisters were touching each other. No hugs or kisses the day of profession. We weren't supposed to talk much with people outside the convent, and we weren't supposed to have any sort of exclusive friendship with any of the sisters. We were to relate to each sister in exactly the same way. All of this was supposed to lead us deeply into the one intimate relationship we were all encouraged to cultivate, the relationship with God. We prayed for four hours every day. Obedience. The vow of obedience meant that we never chose our work or our companions, the place we would live or any of our daily routine. Everything was assigned to us in great detail by our superiors. <coughs> Mother Teresa was the superior general, then there were regional superiors and local superiors. Whatever command any superior gave, we were to obey as if God had commanded it. The superior's direct command was considered the voice of God. The constitutions contained all the most important rules followed by the missionaries of charity. Mother Teresa had written the original constitutions on her knees at night. <clears throat> During Novitiate, more time was given to the study of the Constitutions than to the Gospels. The rules were very important because, as Mother Teresa often repeated, obedience is the virtue that pleases God most. My what the fuck moment? Not yet. <laughs> I had felt called by God to live with the poor and to serve them as Mother Teresa did. The missionaries of charity take a fourth vow, a vow of wholehearted and free service to the poorest of the poor. This is the picture of a home for the dying in Calcutta. And the work of the missionaries of charity has spread all over the world in over 130 countries. And they never did send me to Calcutta. The missionaries of charity began officially in 1950. By 2012, there were 4,500 sisters, as well as several hundred priests and brothers. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm having too much fun up here. My throat can't take it. My first assignment after my vows was back to the South Bronx, where we sometimes took kids from our summer day camp out on field trips into the country. It takes a long time to become a full-fledged nun. Our first vows were valid for only one year. Each year, for six years, we asked permission to renew our vows. After six years of temporary vows, we'd asked to take final vows for life. When Mother gave us permission to renew vows, she'd write a little note, emphasizing the virtues she thought each of us most needed to improve. This was the note she wrote me the first year I renewed my vows. You can see I had a lot to work on. After a year in the Bronx, I was sent to help open a new house in Washington, D.C., where we ran a soup kitchen and several programs for children. Next, Mother sent me to help open a new convent in Winnipeg. We wanted to open a shelter for women and children, and some of the neighbors gave us a hard time. After a year in Winnipeg, it was time for me to return to Rome to prepare for my final vows. This preparation lasted a year, rather like a third year of novitiate, so it was called tertianship. During tertianship, I had to decide whether I would take vows for life or not. I spent a lot of time during tertianship studying Mother Teresa's writings. I had serious concerns about whether I should continue as a sister, mostly because I'd found obedience so difficult and oftentimes saw it as counterproductive. But I hadn't had my what the fuck moment yet. Studying mother's writings helped me fall in love again with her version of serving Jesus in the poor, and I decided to continue. The evening after our final vows, after we posed for this photo, mother gave us our new assignments. I was sent to study theology at Regina Mundi, a school for sisters from throughout the world. We followed a three-year course in the shadow of St. Peter's. For me, an assignment to study was both a blessing and a curse. I liked studying. But since so few sisters were sent to study, an assignment to Regina Mundi meant that you were practically guaranteed to spend the rest of your life working not directly with the poor, but with the formation of the sisters. Not exactly what I'd signed up for, but obedience was God's favorite virtue. During our first summer break from Regina Mundi, I was assigned an unusual task. 
Several years prior, the Vatican had issued a new code of canon law, which stipulated that all communities of sisters, priests, and brothers needed to revise their constitutions, drawing from the spirit of their founders while updating the rules. That task of revising the Missionaries of Charity constitutions fell to me. I couldn't change anything except what canon law required, but I could elaborate where elaboration might be needed. The general chapter, a representative body of sisters from around the world, would then amend and ratify the constitutions as they saw fit. I agreed to this task on one condition, that no one know I was the one doing the work. In the early years of the Missionaries of Charity, eight years before I was born, Mother Teresa had written the original constitutions on her knees by candlelight, and the other sisters had gone to bed. Here I was, with barely a year of final vows, being asked to revise the group's most sacred document. I was afraid that if the sisters came to know that I had anything to do with it, they would have less respect for the document. The job did have one particularly appealing task, though. English had been Mother Teresa's second language, and I was delighted that when I updated the rules, I could also correct the grammar. <laughs> After my studies, as expected, I was appointed novice mistress in Rome. This is my first group of novices on their profession day. <coughs> After one year of working with the novices, I was appointed tertian mistress, a position I held for five years, preparing sisters for final vows. As part of the final vows ceremony, I would call the sisters' names, stand with mother as witness, and then form part of the bodyguard on the way back to the convent. Everybody always wanted to touch mother, and by this time, she was quite frail. Here I stand behind mother during celebrations. Both during these celebrations of vows and at other times, Mother met with political dignitaries, church officials, celebrities, and the poor. The first time Mother met Princess Diana, she did so at our house in Rome. I don't have photos of some of the most important things that happened during the five years I served as tertian mistress. Mother's health declined, and two sisters began to take over effective government of the society, pulling the congregation very far to the right. About the same time, I fell in love, twice. Once with a sister, once with a priest. I've been told my book has more sex in it than one would expect in a story of nuns. <laughs> Others have told me the sex to other stuff ratio seems about right. In any case, my what the fuck moment was on its way. I asked to be relieved of duties in formation and was assigned superior of a community in the outskirts of Rome. I gave myself a year to decide whether to remain or not. And for me, it boiled down to this. If I could really feel myself fully alive, obeying all the rules, the way Jesus promised he had come to bring full life, I just stay, but I watched to see what would happen when I tried to keep all the rules. I continued to long for intimacy. I tried to start programs the poor clearly needed, but I was denied permission. I did not feel fully alive. Reality and story did not match up, and I decided I needed to change my reality. I began the process of leaving the missionaries of charity, writing a letter asking for a leave of absence. With every day, week, and the five full months that my superiors delayed my leaving, hoping I would change my mind, I grew more and more convinced that I needed to go. During all this time of my struggles, mother's health failed more and more. This is a photo taken in the spring of 1997 at our house inside the Vatican. Mother was meeting yet another dignity, and we were looking on very worried. If you look closely, you can see how tired Mother looks, how bent, how sunken her eyes. The next day, I met privately with Mother, who had been informed of my request for a leave of absence. She locked eyes with me and said, Mother could believe this about anyone, but she cannot believe it about you. I had just disappointed the most admired woman in the world. Why did I leave? 
That's what mother wanted to know, and I chose not to tell her. I was afraid she would argue me into staying. Even now, I can't say that it was any one thing that made me decide, but in summary, the group was becoming more and more narrow-minded. I was becoming more open-minded. We weren't a good fit anymore. I discovered that the intimate relations forbidden by the rules were something I wanted and needed. And I longed to help people in truly creative and effective ways. I felt suffocated. As though if I didn't get out of the convent, everything worthwhile within me would die. When I left the sisters after 20 years of service, they gave me a plane ticket and $500. My sister Kathy welcomed me into her family near Houston. In addition to buying Russian technology for Dow Chemical, Kathy is a gourmet cook. I cannot tell you how much I enjoyed her food. <laughs> I felt myself in a completely different world. I was grateful for Kathy and her family for taking me in and teaching me things like how to use a gas pump an ATM machine, and a microwave, to say nothing of that most mysterious of machines, a computer. A few months after I took leave of the sisters, Mother Teresa finally died at the age of 87. She had been attended by several doctors at the mother house in Calcutta, and they did everything they could to prolong her life. Sisters who were there have told me that Mother kept repeating, let Mother go home to Jesus. Does no one love Mother? As you've noticed, Mother Teresa was fond of speaking of herself in the third person. Eventually, the Calcutta neighborhood surrounding Mother House lost power for several hours, and Mother was finally allowed to breathe her last, the defibrillator rendered non-functional. I still loved the sisters and considered them my family. It was very difficult to mourn Mother's passing alone. I attended a memorial service in Houston's cathedral where the bishop went on and on about having met mother once during a layover at George Bush Airport. <laughs> I knelt in the back and cried. No one knew who I was. Then so many things happened. I spent a few weeks in residence at a center for priests and sisters in trouble. That's another story. <laughs> I moved in with my parents. After a job at J.C. Penney's during the Christmas season, I became liturgical director at St. Anne Church as a favor to the priest who had been a family friend for decades, all of which meant that these two guys were my bosses. After a few months, I tried with two other sisters to form community according to Mother's Spirit. Didn't quite work. Eventually, I got a bachelor's degree in English at Lamar University and a master's degree of creative writing at Vermont, where I began writing a book based on my experiences as a sister, and I met a very interesting fellow, a Dr. Farmer poet type. We were drawn to each other. Something was beginning to happen. A few weeks after that residency in Vermont, the church sent me to a continuing education program at Ghost Ranch in New Mexico. There I met a woman who told me she would pay my graduate school tuition if I'd help her start a foundation for women writers. I thought God had answered my prayers. A room of her own foundation became a huge part of my life, now internationally recognized as a top tier writers organization. When I returned from Ghost Ranch to Texas, my Dr. Farmer poet and I talked on the phone every day. He invited me to move in with him. I was happy, not only because I was falling for Luke, but also because leaving Beaumont would give me an easy exit from the church. I'd had several WTF moments, and though I still believed in God, I knew I was finished with the church. I continued writing my book, and I continued to travel. I accompanied a disabled friend to Japan, where we visited peaceful gardens and noisy temples. My sister Kathy gave me a present for my graduation from Goddard, a trip to Bali with Luke. We arrived during the celebration of Balinese New Year, during which each small neighborhood constructed their own monster gods, carried them in a parade through the town center, then burned them in a ceremonial bonfire. We also attended a Balinese funeral in the Hindu tradition. A priest perched atop a platform, much incense, much music. I even returned to Rome for Mother Teresa's beatification where the sisters and I were happy to see each other and where I kept pretty quiet about the fact that I wasn't going to church anymore. 
I'd witnessed Shinto and Buddhist traditions, Hindu ceremonies, and briefly revisited my Catholic roots. By this time, one of my own sisters was a Muslim wearing a veil, and another identified as Sufi, whirling and dancing long into the night. I saw people everywhere longing for ritual, for a sense of transcendence and meaning. But I was beginning to realize that nothing I had seen or experienced had satisfied that need for me. When I got back from Rome, a friend gave me a very interesting book. <laughs> Sam Harris invited me to return not to story and to tradition, but to reason. Reading The End of Faith was a great release for me and a return to myself. Though I felt Harris's interpretations of religious belief were sometimes overly simplistic, I resonated with the basic concepts he expressed, and I loved the beauty of his prose. One day I climbed a hill on that farm in Vermont, and I called out loud, God, if you are really there, tell me what you're like. I must know. I listened. The words formed within me. God is like the best parts of yourself. I've been pondering those words ever since. I think they're words about the goodness of humanity and about the psychological mechanisms of projection and wish fulfillment. After my moment on that hill in Vermont, I was finally able to say, what the fuck, not only to the Catholic Church, but also to the concept of God and religious faith. I put my trust guardedly in this world and the humans who inhabit it. I experience life without the veil of a supernatural story, and I enjoy the mystery of living in a world where I get to create my own meaning. I must admit, I rather like it. I became a humanist celebrant. Thank you, thank you. And I work to celebrate memorials and funerals and one-of-a-kind personal weddings. I do lots of other things, including exceed my time when I'm speaking to you. <laughs> the only other thing I want to say before I open up to a few questions is um, your stories was the next thing I wanted to talk about. Your stories are just as important as mine. They might not feature as many names that people recognize, but it's what happens in the heart, it's what happens in the mind that really counts. I invite you during this weekend to approach your neighbor during breaks, at lunch, whenever, and say, tell me your story. When was your what the fuck moment? Start the conversation however you like. And when you're the one who's asked, reply, giving special emphasis, perhaps, to those moments when you really had that shift in your mind, when you realized that story and reality didn't match up. And maybe I'll get an invitation next time to finish the rest of my presentation. <laughs> who knows? Thank you so much. You're clapping so much. My smile makes my face hurt. Have we heard that today? Yeah. So, we have five minutes for questions. If you have a question for Ms. Johnson, please come up to this microphone to space left uh, and address her. Hello. Hello. At what time did you ever realize that you couldn't stand the misogyny of the church? At what time did I realize I couldn't stand the misogyny of the church? Um, yeah, I was still a nun during that time. I was, yeah. Um, I always kind of kept hoping it would change the way lots of women who remain nuns do. I think it's a futile hope. I remember once at the ordination of a priest. It was actually the day after the ordination. And so this was a priest I knew. It was, he was celebrating his first mass. and. One of the priests uh, was delivering a homily who was a very good friend of mine who knew me very personally. And at a certain point in his sermon at this first mass of this newly ordained priest, he looked straight at me and he said, and we must say, 
priests would have nothing if it weren't for the sisters and all the good hard work they do. Your work is so important. I think that's the moment that it really hit. <laughs> I think that was it. And it's also maybe kind of why I enjoy being a humanist celebrant these days. Yes, thank you. Um, having had personal experiences with Mother Teresa, how would you characterize her devotion to God? Total, complete, and absolute. Um, she was a very sincere person. Um, many of you have probably read Christopher Hitchens' book, The Missionary Position, so aptly named. Um, and Christopher had nearly all of his facts right, but he didn't always have the interpretation right. Having lived, as you say, day by day, I knew her very, very well. She was in Rome a lot. Um, <laughs> There was nothing insincere about her devotion to God. She was completely and totally dedicated, the most focused person I've ever known, the most self-sacrificing person I've ever known, very, very far from the wisest person I've ever known. So before or after your own deconversion, were you aware or are you now aware of people who also had a deconversion moment, but remained in the, in the church service because it's all they knew? Like how many closeted atheists are there within the Catholic structure? There are a lot of closeted atheists um, within Catholicism, Evangelical Protestantism, Judaism, where it's not such a bad thing anyway. You don't really kind of have to hide. Um, Islam. I belong to an organization which some of you might be familiar with, The Clergy Project, founded by Richard Dawkins. <laughs> Um, the clergy project is specifically for clergy people who have doubts and there are some who are considered, I forget the exact term, but you're, you're either an outed member or you're still kind of in the closet and so we're, it's completely totally online, you can be anonymous or not as you want, but it's a discussion about what clergy people do or don't do <laughs> when they discover that they no longer believe in God or in religion or in any of that what the fuck stuff. Hi Mary, uh, there's a question in the back from a young woman. Hello. Hi, uh, sorry, um, hopefully I can speak loud enough. Um, I'm a former social worker and of course one of the things social workers do is try to help a lot of people. Um, what was your perspective of Mother Teresa's ability to provide pain relief and support for the individuals that were dying? Yeah, pain relief was not Mother Teresa's main concern. We lived a kind of schizophrenic life in this arena because yes, we were supposed to help the poor, but on the other hand, suffering was what made you really like Jesus. So you don't want to take away a person's suffering completely because that's an honor. You're suffering like Jesus. I mean, WTF. Okay, so um, Mother Teresa definitely helped many, many people. Her sisters helped many, many people, gave them food, gave them shelter, cared for them in various ways, but not in ways that Western social workers, medical people would consider anywhere near appropriate. She wasn't worried about that. She had a home for the dying, not expecting to help them get better, but to provide them a place where they could move perhaps more peacefully into the next life and where if they weren't looking or uh, she might be able to baptize them in secret. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Uh, my name is Dustin Loss and I'm a member of the Clergy Project myself. I was, just real quick. Um, I used to be a Christian apologist who worked for Josh McDowell. I'm sure many of you might know that name. And um, one of the things I struggled with the most was regret. From, so for you, I guess, how did you overcome the regret of thinking you wasted these years of the only life that you get? Because that's something that I had to deal with a lot. Yeah, 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 still dealing with it. What do you do? Um, it's hard. Um, one thing I have done with the fact that I look back over those 20 years when I could have been studying things where I could have perhaps ended up making real effective change, and I look back at the ways in which I mean, I spent hours and hours washing clothes by hand and cutting rotten vegetables and, I mean, years, okay, when you add it all up. And the only thing I can, well, I can say a few things, I suppose, 
is that I think that whole experience did make me more empathetic for people with, with various issues of poverty, issues of mental health, issues. I got to know these people up quite close in a way I probably wouldn't have otherwise, and I think that's a very valuable thing. And the other thing that helps me with the idea of regret is that I got to write a book about it that helps a lot of people, and I really enjoy it when I get emails from people saying, Ah, oh, finally I understand my mother who left the convent and would never talk about it. Oh, finally, whatever, whatever, whatever. And so I've kind of used it that way and I use it in presentations like this. Um, I think it gives me also, as a humanist celebrant, an insight into many cases where the couple who are getting married have no religious beliefs whatsoever, but their families do. And so we want to create a ceremony that absolutely respects the values of those people who are getting married, but doesn't offend or make the family feel like they're doing something wrong and, oh, my child is going to hell. And so I'm able to navigate those boundaries because I've lived on both sides. And I find that also something very useful. But thank you very much. I've enjoyed it.